Nigeria's two major political parties, the All Progressive Congress and the People's Democratic Party, PDP, have been exchanging brickbats ahead of the forthcoming governorship election in Edo State on September 19. Many analysts are saying that if not checked in time, these exchanges could be a precursor to another orgy of violence. Just two years after the nation was jolted by widespread violence during the last general election. Joining us this morning to explore this matter and other issues is Dele Farutimi, a lawyer and a man who describes himself as an agitator with a burning passion for the future of Nigeria. Dele Farutimi, good morning. Thank good you for joining us on the morning show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. Well, quickly, before we begin to talk about elections in Edo and Undo State, uh, I'd like to have your comments on what's happening at the EFCC and the ongoing interrogation, investigation also, of the uh, chairman of that uh, commission, Ibrahim Mago. <sighs> All right. Ordinarily, when you have um, squabbles in the family, such as the APC family or the extended family of the Nigerian ruling class, it is of very little importance to the like of me because ultimately what you find is that the people are really not found anywhere in the consideration of the combatants. If the EFCC decides that he wants to begin to chase his former helmsman, I think it's safe to say he's now suspended. If uh, Buhari suddenly wakes up to the fact that there was always a security report written by his own DSS, or shall we say SSS, five years ago, and suddenly they're waking up to that one now. It just tells you that the, uh, the, the posturing for 2023 has commenced in earnest, and they've started the circles of anti-corruption again. And this circles is always well stalked. But it appears that this time around, the hunter is himself now the hunted. So if the truth be told, one thing we must all wrap our minds around very quickly is that whatever you're seeing happening in the current circles involving Magu and all the allegations of fantastic sums of money walking up and down the place in this fantastic country ruled by the saint of Daura, I frankly speaking, I'm not excited by it. It's just another circus for the Nigerian people to distract them. Because ultimately, if the interest of the people were to have ever, ever, ever at any point been part of the considerations of those who are busy chasing Magua around today, it would have been done five years ago. It wouldn't have commenced just this week just because somebody woke up and decided that they should start their games. How does that change the price of Momo in the market or change the price of Gary for the poor man? on the street who is busy battling the problems of COVID-19, the irresponsibilities of government. It's just another distraction. Call, wake me up the day they formally charge Magu to court like he has been busy chasing small boys, small fries who have stolen 500,000, 200,000, 1 million naira, and the real thieves are around and he knows them, we all know them and nobody does, nobody do anything about those ones. So if they have now woken up and they feel that it's time to distract the people and then be chasing Magu around to have some fun, it doesn't interest me. Frankly speaking, it's of no benefit to the Nigerian people. If they ever charge Magu, then I'll be interested in talking about the Magu issue. There is nothing there. It's just another distraction. They're having their family squabble. Nothing will happen to Magu. Absolutely nothing will happen to him, I can tell you, ahead of time. So please, let's not fool ourselves. It's just a circus. Well, are you more engaged then by what's going on with the Edo State elections? More recently, we had the two heads of, well, the two chairmen of the election committees for APC and PDP, governors Ganduje and Wike, exchanging yeah. barbs, rejoinders, and what have you. But I was, um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. What were, what were your thoughts on these two, you know, gladiators jousting? You know, um, if I was looking to find the illustration, for the book I wrote and that was published last year, Do Not Die in Their War. This Ganduje, Wike, Oshio Mole, uh, Pastor Iyamu, or Baseki, this is their love tango. 
illustrates it better than anything I could have dreamt up when I was writing the original piece that titled the book itself in 2015 before Muhammadu Buhari was elected. Here is the point. Do not die in their war. It's their war. They have no interest in the people. The same... Oh, look, let me put it this way. God forbid that we have to continue abiding with this set of rulers by 2023. But don't be surprised if you find that by 2023, these characters have decided that Nigeria is better ruled by a one-party system that would now encompass each and every one of them because in reality, you do not have any sort of ideology separating any one of these people. Wike and Ganduje tomorrow, my, you might just find that that's the ideal ticket they'll start selling to all of us in 2023. They'll start telling us Ganduje is the new saint and Wike is the one that should follow. In 2012, Pastor Iyamu was part and parcel of the former Oshio Omole's election. The same Oshio Omole branded him irredeemably. Obasan just didn't do a better job on Atiku than Oshio Omole did on Iyamu. All these things, they, 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 they should serve as history lessons. People should look at these to wake themselves up. We have too many people who get easily distracted by these things, but the point is this. This is yet another example of the fact that the Nigerian people do not matter in the calculation of the rulers of Nigeria. All that matters to them at any point in time, the only thing that is constant and never shifts, their own interest. Those interests have nothing to do with religion. They don't remember religion when they are, doing, when they are identifying their interests. They don't remember tribes. The only people for whom they always emphasize these differences are the people themselves. So if is a Yamu, I get confused sometimes. You don't even know what party they belong to. It's always about the next election, the next office. The, there are no principles involved. You're talking about Magu. It's the same thing. Yes, day before yesterday, Magu was the one chasing thieves. Today, Magu is the thief. Tomorrow now, I will not be surprised if they start telling me that Magu is the new saint we should all coalesce around and begin to crown Osana in 2023. The only people who never ever seem to understand the fact that their own interests have never marked out are the Nigerian people themselves. You tell me, oh, they are useful and they are the oppressors. Let me tell you, the worst phase of poverty you will see in, you will find in Nigeria is in the northern part of Nigeria. You will find all sorts of Nigerians working as sweep, road sweepers, toilet washers, doing all sorts of menial jobs wherever you go in the world. And some of them do it with qualifications. You will not find a full animal, cab driver or anything of the sort abroad. So it's very easy to buy into that stupid stereotype of the full animal being the oppressor of the Nigerian people. But come back to Nigeria. The same Nigerians you find abroad willing to do the menial job because of the opportunities afforded because when they go there, they know that even if you are a street sweeper, your children still have access to good schools. They have access to they have access to, you yourself, you have access to healthcare. Look at the way they are dying like flies. With all the stealing, their brains have not told them that COVID-19 has changed the game. They still think it's the same old stupid games. If you can afford good healthcare, what about the drivers? What about your guards? What about your big, what about all the people who work around you? COVID is the leveler. Everybody will address this. But here is the point. As long as we continue to fool ourselves into thinking that we can somehow appoint wolves to guard the flock and then expect the, that the wolves will become vegetarians, we deny the evidence of our own eyes. We see these things and yet we deny it. Oh, or more let spoke these words. They're out in the open. It's all over the place. And yet the same man comes out and is preaching to the people that the man he testified was a thief Anyway, thinking about it, though, how can Oshio Omole testify to the character of anybody? <laughs>
Okay. Uh, delicious. <laughs> delicious no, vibe. These things are <laughs> vexatious in the extreme. I know. I know. And, and if a lot of you have read your book, Don't Die in the Award, they will know you even said even more. Uh, I, I want to take you on this. You've, you've spoken a lot about the political character. But uh, I want to quote MQ Abiola. He said something that struck me many years ago. Okay. He said, The day water drawers and wood hewers discover their destiny, that's the day they start to move in the path of reality, and nothing can stop them. So, which day is going to be that day that water drawers, wood hewers, taxi drivers yeah. will discover their purpose? in this country and be able to rise up and claim what truly belongs to them. Because, you know, it's very shocking in this country. Because of the economic system, we don't have people that are bus drivers for 35 meritorious years because they are looked down on in society. But in other climes, they are respected bus drivers that have been there. I mean, the father of the mayor of London was a bus driver. So when are we going to have those people rise up? And even if that's the job they are going to do, they'll have a sense of dignity in their nation. Hmm. <laughs> Let me say this. M.K. Abiola could say what he said because in the age in which he lived, Nigeria had not become the predatory state that it has become today. What you will find today is that the Nigerian state has deliberately weaponized poverty against its people. I use the word it because you really can't call Nigeria a motherland. If it were to be a mother, it would be a cannibalistic mother. And if it's a father, it's a most irresponsible father. You have 14 million children trampling the streets of Nigeria. Most of them drug addicted. No future, nothing in front of them. Walking the street, that is the population of a lot of countries. Now, M.K. Wakibiola could talk about the day the hewers of wood, their children could rise up because they would by then have first of all come to the knowledge of the fact of their humanity. If you see the way the Nigerian state has dehumanized the Nigerian people to the point where life has become discounted, you, what you then begin to realize is that before that day will come, several implosions, such as the ones that are already happening, would continue to happen. However... Some of us had the benefit of living in a Nigeria where it was possible to move across the class line because the state was equitable to an extent. We still dealt with the, that because we, I grew up in the age when you began the institutionalization of the madness that has turned Nigeria into the madhouse that it has become today. It was in my age. I was a victim of uh, educational disadvantage state, quota stupid systems, all those systems and isms, everything that the institutionalization of the injustice that destroyed the fabric of Nigeria happened as I was growing up. So here is the thing. For Nigeria to ever retrace its steps, Nigerians hate hearing this, but it's inevitable. There has to be a complete turnaround. It cannot be that the purpose of the Nigerian state would be the maintenance of the ruling class to the neglect of every other class. And the middle class exists solely for the exploitation of the state in order to keep the state and its rulers in style. Nobody is trusted to vote. You vote on our behalf. Each and every one, I, I dare say, that if you call yourself a member of the Nigerian state, you live in this country, it is possible that if you are even blessed enough to have a TV set and you're watching now, and each and every one of the persons interviewing me this morning, I dare say this, you're spending nothing less than 60% of your income educating your children. My father did not spend 5% of his income educating me because the Nigerian state had a functional educational system. Even your megats send their children to private schools now. Nobody goes to the government hospitals anymore. Everybody. So when Abiola was talking, he was still talking within a system that had some measure of normalcy within which people could function as human beings. 
the average Nigerian has been dehumanized to the point where he, you can even begin to question his humanity. I had listened to all sorts of statistics about the morbidity of COVID and all of that. But that can only be said to be true in a system where the human life is valued. Who is testing in Nigeria? All that would have happened in Nigeria is that you suddenly increase the, pop, the capacity of our witches and wizards because nobody is testing anyway. If you are going to test in this town and you really want your result to come out, you have to go private. Even the state has sanctioned that. It is the abandonment of the people to their own fate and the erection of a system that exists solely for the protection of the powerful and the promotion of their interest. Who is looking for the poor man? And the poor man, having lost the capacity to think because he had been impoverished ab initio by the weaponization of ignorance. An ignorant man is doomed to poverty. When you have now gone to the point where the average man on the Nigerian street does not even know what he can do to drag himself out of the perpetual poverty into which he had been locked by the system. Even when you try to do... Leg A friend of mine said the other day, he said, almost every avenue for legitimate improvement in Nigeria has been blocked off. It's almost as if you are even being begged to go and become a criminal by the state itself because you'll be punished for your honesty by the Nigerian state. So exactly what are we talking about? Abiola can afford to talk about lofty goals about the children of hu the children of the hewers of wood and fetchers of water are only seeking to well, survive. Well, Dele, yes, sir. Well, I, I'd like to interrupt you at this point. Uh, Please. First, I, I don't mean to be cheeky, but this oh. is on a lighter note. This Please. is your hairstyle. <laughs> is it the COVID style? <laughs> it's a protest. <laughs> because the last time I saw your picture, uh, oh. this was not your hairstyle. It's a protest against an immoral, useless society that does not even appear to know that... Well, you've been very consistent. I mean, in your book, Do Not Die in Their War, uh, in one part you say Nigerians are living a lie, in another part you attack the media. Yeah, that's, yes, not, I did. that's not the subject for this uh, conversation this morning because I thought you were a bit unfair to a journalist. I'll be glad to engage you yeah. one of these days. <laughs> well, that'll be fine. But what does it mean to you to be a citizen? Are there aspects of Nigerian life and society that inspire you? Don't forget uh, that this is the country of Wole Shinka, this is the country of Chino Achebe, this is the country of uh, Chimamanda uh, Adichie, this is the country of great people. But this morning, you've been painting a very gloomy picture. Nah, and some nah. Nigerians who believe that this is a great country and who still believe that Nigeria can make it will think that you are just looking at one side of the country. Uh, let me, are there things that inspire you about let, Nigeria? Let me say this. I would not live anywhere outside Nigeria. If I moved out of Nigeria on exile, I'll probably be dead in less than two years. I can't live anywhere else. I was born to live in this country. A long time ago, I came to one realization. If you happen to see a problem, it's almost always because you have been blessed to either be a part of the solution to that problem, or it is just your remit to draw attention to the problem. It doesn't necessarily mean you have any role to play beyond drawing attention to that problem. Now, here is the thing. Nigeria is a beautiful country. I have been blessed to travel in this country. Before Boko Haram made part of the not impassable and a place not to go again. I was blessed to travel to a place called Mobi, the beautiful scenery. I would have loved to have lived in the times of the Malaysia in when you could grab a jeep and drive from one end of Nigeria to the other. I would have, been, I would have loved it. This is a beautiful country. Our rulers are the blight, spared all the natural disasters. We've been, we, we've been caused by horrible rulers, and we are locked into a system that has made it impossible to find a way out of that cycle unless you find a way to break the system of governance and the structures because it has made it impossible for anything productive to happen beyond the maintenance of the rulers in office. That the fact that Nigeria is a blessed place is beyond argument. I feel sorry for the Nigerians who think they are sane and run away. I can't blame them for running away because only the insane really remains here and believe that this is fine. There is nothing fine about our reality. There is nothing fine about it. So yes, I agitate about Nigeria. Yes, 
I despair when I look at the sickling reality of our existence. Yes, but here is the point. Nigeria is a beautiful country. It could be much better than it is if only, if only we will stop allowing ourselves to be distracted. But look, see, look at what we discussed this morning. Edo madness, Magu idiocy, all of them. If Magu is the one who was chasing thief, now he's the one being chased. And they are not even ashamed that it had been in the public space for over five years that this guy had a, is of questionable character, but yeah, they are busy chasing innocent people up and down the place. You leave the real thieves. You are chasing the small fries. People, I want to come in here. Yes, please. And continue with Dr. Abati's line of questioning about yes, the role of the citizen. Do not die in their war. Yeah. And some of the comments that you've made here just about the enormity of the problem. It almost seems as if you're encouraging or advocating a more detached standpoint for the citizens. No. Whereas, whereas it has to be our action that will change things. Look at what happened looking the world, going by the literal meaning of do not die in their war. Yeah. If you look at the Vietnam War, Quang Duc, that Buddhist monk and self-immolation that sparked the Vietnam War in the 1960s, and Mohammed Bouazizi, self-immolation sparked the Arab Spring. What would you like to see the Nigerian citizens do at this point? Let me say this. When I said do not die in their war, what happened was that I set out to write a book, and then I found that I couldn't write that book without writing two other books before that book could be written, because I needed to lay a foundation for what I really have to say. And what I have to say is very simple. Do not die in their war. Choose your own war in which to die. We will all die someday. That is the one thing that is available to each and everybody. Rich, poor, tall, short, it doesn't matter. We would all die. So if I'm going to die, I'm not going to die in their own war. I will pick my own war in which I will die. And I will say this. Do not die in their war was meant as the foundation for an argument. And that argument is simple. A war that has been criminalized more or less in Nigeria, and it's the world revolution. But here is the point. If you go to the Latin root of that word, it comes from the word says revolver. Revolver says to turn around. The Nigerian state has done a fantastic job of making everyone who says the word revolution appear to be some violent criminal. I have never been a violent man in my life. But here is the point. I have a duty to my children, three of them, to that generation. I have a duty to them to make sure that even if... It is unachievable in my own lifetime. The idea is planted in their head, and it is never allowed to die. That this is not normal. The way we are, it's not normal. And there are other ways, aside from the madness. 774 local governments. Do we have 774 healthcare centers? 774 local government. That's 774 local government chairmen, each of them with official cars. That means at least 10 councillors. Each of them with official cars. Do we have 774 primary schools in those locations? COVID is here. They are not investing in healthcare. They are buying more cars, official cars. Listen, it is, my own argument is simple. Nigeria cannot continue like this. I have no guns for anybody. I have no stone to throw for anyone. My protests have almost always been silent. I left my hair in protest of Yele and Agbajalingo and Bakari's incarceration. I leave my hair in protest of all the madness. Somebody like Yele cannot move beyond Abuja today. But there are criminals moving up and down the place. What has Yele done? What did he do? He called for a revolution. He woke up idiots like us who are sleeping, thinking that you could still talk to this system somehow. He woke us up. That's all he did. And they were stupid enough to be chasing the guy around. He has never carried a gun. You kept him in Abuja. He has a family. How can we even talk about us having any justice in Nigeria? Exactly what has that guy done that is being kept in that place? Exactly what? And then, look, we can sit down here and be speaking all this jogon to Renchi, but I said this. Do not die in their war, yes, but that is not a call to cowardice. It's a call to clarity. It's their war. 
Obaseki wants to become governor, uh, or Yamu, anybody who dies in Edo State fighting for those ones, they are fools. So uh, Ganduje, the one with uh, Babariga Bank, is now calling Wike a thief. What's new? How does that change the price of Pomo for the poor man? How is that my business? Do not die in their war. That's what it means. Don't die in their war. Identify it for them. It's their war. Don't die in that one. If you don't want die, used as cannon don't fodder. be used as cannon fodder. That is yeah. what do not die in their war means. That's what it meant. In 2015, when I was speaking that title, it was because I saw the conglomeration of crooks who are gathering together, calling themselves APC. And then I saw the saint of Daura, the same person I had been voting for, thinking that there was some shortcut to the Nigerian problem. We all thought the man could do something. But 2014 unveiled him for me. I saw clearly that it was a waste of time. How was he going to fight his friends? Okay, uh, Dele, I, I want to come in here. And uh, I, I want us to start looking in terms of uh, solutions. Mm. And I, I want to ask a question. Was it that we're not, you know, uh, matured enough before we even got our independence? Because I don't know where, you know, this friction as the way as nationhood uh, started from. Uh, I think it was uh, Alexis de Tocqueville that was saying, uh, never mistake uh, yearnings for immaturity politically. And it looks as though that the structures that were put on ground by the British, when we came to, you know, nationhood as a country in the 60s, where we gained independence, we couldn't put out those structures. Because you talk a lot very passionately the problem is not these current politicians on ground. There were structures that were put there by the British that still exist till date. So if we say colonialism has ended, no, I'll disagree. It's not ended because it's still the colonial mindset we still practice in everything. Take, for instance, it was only COVID that made us understand we didn't have laws on ground to fight a pandemic. We had to revert to a 1926 law. Our Mental Health Act is still pretty much of the 50s. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Abati. Yeah, we, no, have right. yeah, we have a Kalantine Act. Yeah, we have a Kalantine Act. But most of the ones we're still looking at was still the 1926 law. Our Mental Health Act is not of the 50s. So it's still pretty much everything pre-colonial. Our Police Act, is it not of when? I can't even remember because it's not our police, it's their police it's act. It's their police act. So we still function on all of those things. See, um, let me... Say this. When there is a misunderstanding of purpose, abuse becomes inevitable. The British built a system that was designed for the expropriation of African wealth, colonialism. So they built a system that was efficient for the purpose. The system the British left behind also, at least leading up to the independence, there were several constitutional conferences. Ibadan, yeah, Lagos, Enugu, Lancaster, all sorts of constitutional conferences. And an agreement was reached. Let's have a federal system. And that federal system was not so rigid. It allowed each region to pursue whatever it considered its priority within the federation itself. So to a very large extent, yes, the British left us a system, and most of what they left for us are intact, but the most important part of what they left for us, we destroyed in 1966. The capacity for each side to grow, we destroyed it. When we destroyed it in 1966, we replaced it with a system that was already in contemplation even before the British left, but we don't read our history. And that system was the plan. Was already, there was already a fallback position that if power was lost and it came to the point of the military coming into play, it was always going to become a unitary system. It was inevitable. You cannot have the military command system and then maintain a federal structure. So the moment you destroy the federal structure, the moment you destroy the parliamentary system, the moment you have a military command system, it simply meant that the only purpose of the Nigerian state from 1966 became the maintenance of the state. The interest of the citizens, the promotion of, their, the promotion of those interests, the development of the society itself became 
issues that took the back burner. So it became more or less <coughs> the maintenance of persons. And it was no longer about building anything per se. So yes, you see all those lacuna in our laws because the people themselves are not the priority. Is the, you'll, see a lot, you'll see so many laws when it comes to the security of the state. So many laws when it comes to repressing people. But you really not see too much movement when it comes to measures that would promote good governance, promote the welfare of the citizens. You ask the other time, you say, who is the Nigerian citizen? Really, we don't have citizenship. We just have the rulers and the ruled. And in between, those who are able to buy themselves some measure of rights because they have some privileges accrued into them by, by virtue of wealth. So in reality, you are not a citizen in Nigeria. They are not a citizen. It is a state of impunity. If you are a citizen, it would then mean that you have rights and you know your rights. And those rights will stand regardless of who you are up against. But that's not the case in Nigeria. I could come out of your studio and find myself a guest of your friends down the road, and I might be there without my family being notified for as long as they care. That's the reality of the Nigeria in which we live. So we can lie to ourselves about the fact that we are in some democracy, but we all know that we are, at least those of us who are conscious enough to see the truth, we know that we are not in any democracy. We are in a feudal system that masquerades as a democracy. Uh, Dele, I think you said a lot about the problem with uh, Nigeria, leadership, yeah. basically. Uh, taking us back to uh, Chino Achebe. But I'd like to uh, bring up another issue with you. Apart from being an agitator, you are a legal practitioner. I was. Oh, you are no longer practicing? I decided that I'd seen enough of the rot that I was witnessing when I turned 50 a couple of years ago. I decided I'd had enough. I don't so know. agitation is now your full-time I just, I just write and I make noise, hoping that some people wake up that's all. Sometimes you shout into time, and in the womb of time, somebody else will hear you long after you're gone, hopefully. Yeah, but still, I mean, as someone who had uh, once been uh, a legal practitioner, what are your thoughts on the uh, important event coming up in the bar this month? That's the uh, election of a new uh, president uh, for the NBA. What role do you think that lawyers should be playing? Do you think uh, that the bar has been playing the right kind of role in terms of defending uh, the rule of law uh, in the face of uh, an administration that says that national interest is more important than the rule of law, more or less. The first department of Nigeria to be lost before Nigeria was lost was the judiciary. And the moment the judiciary was lost and impunity began to stroll around in Nigeria, what you then had was that even the legal profession itself became part and parcel of the problem. I am particularly interested in this year's NBA election, and I'm interested because I know one, I know a man there for whom I'll stand any day of the week and say that he's a man of honor and integrity, additional Gulano. He's running in the election. There are machinations to keep him off the ballot, but we'll, we'll find out very soon just exactly how independent our court systems are, and we'll find out just in good time exactly how much even the profession itself believes in the rule of law. I would not want to say much because, I, like I have declared, I am an interested party in this year's NBA election. The NBA has become a defunct lion, defunct. They pulled out his fangs. All this madness is going on in our country. When was the last time the NBA was able to do anything or say anything? It become complicit in our own rape. The court system, look, let's tell ourselves the truth. Lawyers, 90% of Nigerian lawyers are litigation people. When COVID came and they are busy opening shopping malls, they are opening one thing or things have been open in Nigeria, but the courts are still working partially. Do you know the number of Nigerian citizens who are languishing in prison? And what has the Nigerian Bar Association had to say about this? Nothing. The Nigerian Bar Association has become, in fact, it is, sometimes I feel so ashamed to call myself a lawyer when I see the state of lawlessness and injustice that roams around in our courts 
the cops are no better than brothels. Don't let's lie to ourselves. So exactly, it's, the Nigerian judiciary is not spared the madness of our state. So the NBA has a role to play. It is not meant to be a, the exclusive club of some SAN person. Why should it suddenly be that? Since it became the exclusive preserve of the SANs, how many of them have talked for the poor in this country? Exactly what has the NBA done to deepen our democracy? The NBA has become a thoroughly irrelevant body in the machination of Nigerian politics and their politicians. And it is time that it got back his act, because the way it is right now is largely becoming irrelevant. Well, thank you, Dele Farouk. I you. guess that's all we'll be able to take. And I hope that, that lawyers uh, have listened to you and that mm -hmm. they, are, they are part of this conversation. Thank you very much indeed thank for, you for joining us on The Morning Show.